But what we want to do in this session is to pick up on the previous one, which has explained how far we've gotten already with a Green Deal that is more than what uh, uh, was expected a few years ago. Yeah, there is more action, there's more going on. Um, there is still challenges with the implementation, we see that. It's still in full implementation, um, both on actually getting the legislation through and then let alone the actual implementation at the national level. So the, we, we have all reasons to keep on going strong, uh, keep up the speed. But if we look at the reality, and I will show you a few slides to remind us of the reality of what's really needed. Um, and these are data from the agency, from the European Environment Agency, and, and from others. And it's just a bit of a reflection on if we look beyond these next two years, and how do we get a narrative uh, to the decision makers, I think. And as an agency, we are part of the institution, of course, but we are also independent and we lean on the evidence that we gather to inform the decision makers and dominantly, of course, the European institutions, but also our country network, uh, the country network of the agency. Um, and so I try to do this quickly because I want this great panel that is representing youth, business, science, and civil society uh, to have the, enough time for their interventions and for their introductory remarks of what they think uh, we need to secure um, after those elections and, and what is the context uh, that we need for that. This is a graph from the State of Environment report from 2020. And it's, uh, of course, in those last two years, we didn't make a huge change from what we noted two years ago, we have to be honest. This is also pre-COVID, another honest remark. And what you see here is dominantly that on the low carbon end, we're not doing too bad, but when it comes to the natural capital, it's quite in the red, and the health part, the pollution part, we're doing some good stuff, but there are still challenges. This was one of the most hopeful um, statements, I think, from a president of a commission that I have ever witnessed, um, because it was putting nature back into the center of the debate. Um, we see a lot of good things happening there, um, but we also see that there are challenges, not in the least uh, through um, some um, distorted news that comes from some parts of society about uh, where and what we can do to secure nature in times of war and in times of so-called, um, no, not so-called, but at least in Europe you could argue that it is a so-called food security uh, element. But that is all part of this nature agenda that we need to keep going and the nature restoration law was amazingly uh, agreed, at least proposed by the Commission last week, which was a major breakthrough. This is the reality of the targets that we have in front of us. With all the um, implementation of the Fit for 55, which it says itself, we will reach that 2030. It's still to be seen whether we get it all implemented. But the big challenge, and this is why I'm saying it here, is beyond 2030. That's where the systemic changes will have to happen. And if you look at the reality, it's not with efficiency gains that we will do this. This is much more fundamental after 2030. And I think what this will be the debate for 24 for the elections has to look, obviously, at least uh, beyond uh, even 2030 um, to make it that happen. Um, just to give you an, an impression of what this really means, um, the International Environment Agency measured 6% of global emissions drop during COVID on the yearly basis on that very year where everything kind of, or much of our activity stopped. What is the reality is that to get to the 2050 net zero, we have to double the reduction that we witnessed during COVID and do that twice or even more than twice times. So that is the reality of how we have to reduce our impact on, on, the, on the planet. An important part of the post-2024 or the 24 debate and the 2040 targets on climate will be discussed in what is a new uh, advisory board that is hosted by the EAEA. Uh, it's not, it's an independent climate board uh, headed by Ottmar Edenhofer now. They will work a lot on getting uh, the 2040 target uh, argumented and explained and, and um, evidenced. Uh, and they will also focus a lot on what we've heard this morning already, which is the biggest nut to crack is the whole land use and the, um, of which of course agriculture is a big part. When we talk about zero pollution, again, we have made progress, uh, but we are far from that uh, zero net zero pollution uh, target. Uh, but here, we should be clear, if the Green Deal 
isn't fully implemented, the health consequences are immense. Yesterday, the agency released a report on the cancer-related environmental context, and it is, it is really a scary, honestly, a scary report, but it is not just scary. It also should motivate us to get that target and those uh, things fully implemented. We will have to look at measurement. This is what the eighth environmental action program does. It's sometimes a bit snowed under with the, group, the European Green Deal and all the other strategies, but it's ultimately that plan and these indicators that will show us whether we're on the right track, and they will continue until 2030. So they are also relevant in the debate on the uh, post-24 um, context. I'm using this slide, and it's uh, just echoing what was said this morning. I think the biggest challenges are integration of our policies and linking them up. Um, we see that um, a lot of initiatives are taken on one hand, but then when it comes to the big levers, we see that it is hampering and that, uh, that there are just that we're not moving in the right direction. It's mostly to do with connecting these policies better and to have a clear stance on what this greening on a cap really means. Uh, again, there is hope, um, but we are far, very far from target on this one. And then one, two more thoughts before I hand over to the colleagues here to make their introductory uh, statement. Um, the leaving no one behind was said this morning. I think if you look at maps, sometimes this helps. If you, the GDP in those countries in the east, we all know, is lower. And the, um, the squared um, countries are where the premature deaths are um, uh, much higher than in other parts of Europe. And so this is, this is a very clear picture that nobody can, can uh, contest. It's just a reality, and it's a reality we have to be attentive to. Hopefully the Social Climate Fund will do the job, but uh, if you hear the challenges that we heard this morning, then it, it seems that this redistribution uh, needs much more uh, action. Finally, um, we look, have to look at a transitionary approach here. It is about a systems approach, and a system approach goes down to the core of the problem, which is basically the production and consumption models. And we need to look much more on the demand side of things. We look very much at the supply side of the, of the solution or the problems, but it's the demand side that is a real challenge. It's our consumption footprint, and it has, of course, a global impact as well. And I wanted to point at all the efforts that we could do in the right direction, which is the green arrow here, and that has its pathway and it has its challenges. Uh, and I think there's a lot of policy in the making to do that right. But if you look at the other way, we have to do a lot of, we have to stop doing a lot of things. And that's sometimes forgotten in the debate. Eh? We have to focus on what we should stop doing. And of course, in the middle is where you get most of the conflicts. Eh? It is, uh, that is obvious and it will have to have a systemic transitionary uh, approach. And here you have the list of all these things that if we would be able to tackle those, they would make a huge difference compared to, uh, to even the current policies that are on the table. These are the, the real big levers to make a systemic change. Difficult, societally difficult, uh, but this is something that needs to continue to be on the table um, for the next uh, legislation. A lot of questions here that I hope the panel may refer to later. And then I end with this uh, beautiful elephant. It's a, a narrative series that the agency also does. So apart from a lot of the core work that we do on the, on the legislation support, on the monitoring, on the data gathering with the countries, uh, we also produce knowledge that goes beyond uh, and looks further down the road. Um, and it has to do with foresight. By the way, there's just a foresight report released uh, from the European Commission that I would advise you to look at because that's gonna help us also to have a debate on the 24, post 24. Um, and just, Let's be honest, one point that I may have not raised enough here is the global context. Um, if you look at the emissions uh, reductions in Europe, they are not looking bad. Huh? We're looking actually quite good. But it was said earlier, it's a small part of the emissions that we see in Europe, but it's a bigger part of those emissions that we don't see in Europe. And that is something that is, is part of the consumption context and, and something that is a very uncomfortable debate. Here in this group, I think it might be still uh, doable to have a fundamental debate on our consumption uh, volume, but as soon as you go out of there, it gets much more difficult. So this I wanted to use as a scene setter, and I still hope that I'm reasonably in time, doesn't look too bad. And I'm now going to hand over uh, to Charlotte, uh, Charlotte Helpin. Um, she is a tenured researcher here at the Sciences Po. That means half of the people in the room will know her, I'm sure, at least half of the people in the room. Um, and she's uh, in the Center for European Studies and Comparative Politics. And 
my question to you, uh, Charlotte, and for you to have your introductory remarks around is, is the political polarization that we see currently in, in Europe. We've seen it in France, we have to be honest there, we've just uh, witnessed uh, a very interesting election uh, period and campaign and outcome. Um, what will be that the impact of that continued polarization um, during the next election rounds? And what do you think, how can it impact the future of the Green Deal? Charlotte, over to you. Thank you, uh, Luke. Thanks for the organizers for having me. Um, that's, that's an excellent question. I think when, when I received that question, I thought, you know, how, how can we really tell about the future? We just went through some major unexpected crises. You know, we just had the COVID crisis, and we had the war in Ukraine. Those are things that probably none of us expected a year ago. Uh, and this is bound to have some significant impact also the way through which the political landscape will evolve over time. Um, and so when thinking about what continued polarization means and what it means for the Green Deal, it really means that um, the Green Deal, and more specifically its implementation, I come back to this in a minute, will become a more conflictual issue in the sense that now that we have the vague objectives, we have the ambitious goals that are set up, we need to go into the tiny details. We need to go beyond the low-hanging fruits. We need to start talking about the hard choices that are lying ahead in terms of redistributing income, in terms of redistributing resources, in terms of avoiding some policies, and you started mentioning this, because it means practically dismantling some of our policy areas, some of our uh, governance arrangements. So, when I read um, in the um, uh, latest EU Green Deal barometer that member states were seen as the main barrier, this made me reflect a little bit on what do we know in terms of how, what are the capacities at this moment in order to address these challenges, these political ones, in terms of building coalitions in order to build buy-ins. We need to remind ourselves about what was the context in which the EU Green Deal was introduced. It was introduced in a context of climate protest, post-Brexit agenda, a post-financial 2008 crisis. There was also issues around migration in 2015. Um, there was an impetus for the EU to demonstrate and to renew with a historical intervention of it, which it had been um, um, not forgetting, but putting on side, marginalizing over the past 10 years. So renewing with the EU Green Deal was also a way for a new commission, for a new parliament, to put the issue of climate, to put the issue of the environment back at the center of the stage, but at the center of the agenda in order to foster innovation, to ensure global competitiveness, but also to link with this agenda of the just transition, so the, the no one left behind uh, type of approach. So an opportunity, in a sense, to regain leadership globally, but also within, uh, within the EU. However, this new impetus arrived in the context of a highly fragmented environmental governance system. So this is maybe my political science hat or specialist, you know, specializing in public policy and more specifically in implementation. But we know that environmental governance is quite fragmented in the EU context. It is no news that member states are at the center of things. And indeed, over the past 15 years, their power, their competences, their influence, as well as of national interest, has been regaining importance in the way through which a division of power function between EU institutions, the Commission more specifically, the Parliament and uh, the Council. So we have this context in which we had mainly national interest member states supporting the development of robust coalitions and I just want to take one example to illustrate this and we may come back to this. I think it was a graph published by the uh, EEA a few years ago in its um, uh, 2016 report about how EU eco-innovation ranking and relationship between global competitiveness and stringency on environmental policy helped understand who were the front runners in this picture and here we have Denmark, UK, Finland, Sweden, Germany, all of them mobilizing in favor of more environmental policies in relationship with eco-innovation and global competitiveness. So this is something that we need to keep in mind. Um, however, we also know that there is a strong implementation gap. And this is also something that we have known for quite a long time. And indeed, this is something that the EU has been struggling with for quite some time now. There is no lack of ambitious environmental goal at EU level. There is a lack of ambitious implementation strategy, however, within the context of this uh, governance system. And this also reflects on voting in the council. I just want to bring this um, very quickly. 
not speaking too fast, but I think it's important to reflect on how the voting in the council functions and how it's been functioning over the past uh, few years. Three out of the 2010s, there was a continued increase in abstentions for legislations on environment and opposition for legislation on energy. It means that there, was, there has been no stable supporting coalition. Um, coalitions were unstable, they were built case by case, there was no apparent logic. Um, this is quite different from what we had in the 1990s. It almost looks like the French Parliament nowadays, and I think this is something which is quite disturbing to many observers, but indeed uh, in the 2010s, it's, this has been the case in the EU Council. And so in spite of strong commitments in words, in terms of ambitious goals, um, in terms of the five yearly strategic agenda, the goals have remained vague and the policies have uh, been ambitious. And there's a third point that I also want to mention. The EU Green Deal was introduced in a context in which policy capacities within the EU Commission to deliver on those goals have been systematically dismantled over those past 10 years. So we're talking about a post-conservative agenda, a better regulation agenda, at the Commission and within the Commission, which led to dismantling some of the policy resources and investing a lot of resources into monitoring, into uh, uh, um, uh, developing uh, new indicators, but not necessarily uh, building in terms of um, uh, operational capacities and renationalizing those efforts. So if we want to come back to your, to your question in terms of polarizing and uh, how political change um, uh, uh, and the change political outlook will support or not uh, the Green Deal. In order to support this, there needs to be um, uh, a more um, important resources focusing on implementing the EU Green Deal. And this means uh, redefining the relationship between EU institutions and member states. Yes, member states are maybe a major barrier, but it is also because it is so in this context of EU member states relationship, and this needs to be redefined. We also need to think a bit more specifically about developing more robust coalitions to support implementation strategies. This means reorganizing the commission and maybe the task force on major themes such as ocean adaptation or climate neutral cities are a good beginning. It's just a starting point to mobilize energy within the commission. And just the last point, um, because I know I've been speaking too long, um, the second point we need to focus on is also how to build multi-level capacity building, especially in terms of stronger support, uh, not just to uh, some of the actors that we focused on until now, so uh, firms or uh, 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 businesses and NGOs, but also sub-national levels, cities, regions, um, and building and supporting them to build a systemic approach across levels in order to support some of the avoiding strategies. Thanks, Charlotte. Thanks. Um, what I think is central from what I hear you say, and it's maybe a word that has not been invented yet, or I don't know, but there is the governance gap. <laughs> we have emissions gaps. We, there is also a governance gap, and it's clear that, that um, the debate beyond of what the Green Deal is today needs to also be about how we improve the systems, how we get subnational governments more on board, and force co coalitions, even stronger coalitions, with the business community, and that's my bridge to Lars. Um, Lex, you're the executive vice president at Theatre Park for sustainability and communications. Um, you've been with the company for a very long time. It's a privately owned company, um, and I won't say now much more about that, but I will come back to that uh, if I look at the ambition of, of the company in what they do. You're in the food industry or part of the food industry or for the value chain and, and have an important role there. Um, if you look at the enormous challenges that were also mentioned this morning, yeah, the, the, we look at the energy system, which is, remains a challenge, but it's one that we can even better understand today. We know all, even more about even what's needed in the food system. It's much more complex, and it's clear that that will be a high element on the next uh, legislature. It's, uh, it's inevitable. It was said by Dietrich Samson also um, this morning. Um, how can we actually achieve a transition to this healthy and sustainable uh, and resilient, which is also an important point, uh, food system. And, and what is Tetra Pak's role in that? Thanks, uh, Luke, and thank you very much, everyone, for the opportunity for me to be here today to represent <laughs> business and the private sector. And uh, many of you may know Tetra Pak as a packaging company. Uh, we are the world's largest liquid food processing and packaging company but we also uh, have a central role, therefore, in the food value chain. And 
uh, as we know, the food system is in dire need of a systemic change, a very rapid uh, change. Uh, the data that we saw today and the barometer shows that we are not progressing fast enough. And we believe that all businesses in the value chain uh, have the opportunity to really drive a, a food system transition. Now, I have the opportunity to represent a company that has as its purpose, its purpose for, for being, its purpose for operating, uh, to make food safe and available everywhere, everywhere around the world, right? That is, our, that is our purpose of being. That's why we wake up in the morning. So food is in our purpose. And at the same time as we, as we do that, we also protect food, we protect people, and we protect the planet. So we believe that we are, again, very well positioned to enable a food system transformation, having that as our purpose, being in the middle of the food value chain. Of course, we cannot do it alone. It has to be done in collaboration with all players in the value chain, but also together with policymakers, civil society, and other stakeholders. There's no other way that we can do this, and I think just being here today is a great opportunity for me, a great platform to, uh, to start such, uh, uh, let's say, an integrated approach and a stakeholder approach. Now, on the role that companies that, uh, like Tetra Pak can do around the world, I wanted to give you just uh, some examples of what we actually could do. As part of the contribution to the UN Food System Summit last year, we actually published a white paper that uh, concluded on three pathways, what we can do, we as a food industry and we as Tetra Pak, in order to drive the food system transformation. The first one is to increase access to safe and nutritious food all around the world. That is absolutely fundamental. Food resilience cannot be taken for granted, maybe in Europe, but certainly not uh, all around the world. And I think that you would agree with me that the, uh, the COVID pandemic that we just went through showed that even in, in Europe, food resilience uh, cannot be taken for granted. Value chains were disrupted and we st still see an effect of that. And certainly also the, uh, the, uh, the crisis that we have now with the uh, war in Ukraine also puts a ripple effect on the resilience of the food system. So increasing access to safe and nutritious food is absolutely fundamental. Secondly, uh, reducing food loss and food waste in the whole value chain. Some of you may know that 8%, 8% of all greenhouse gases around the world annually come from food waste and food loss. At the same time as UN reports that 800 million people go to bed hungry every day. 800 million people go to bed hungry every day, while 8% of the greenhouse gas emissions is from food loss and food waste. And being a processing and packaging and a food enabling, food system transformation enabling company, we believe that we have a, a central role in not only decarbonizing the value chain, not only working on circularity, but fundamentally reducing or be an enabler through our innovation uh, to actually reduce food waste and food loss along the value chain. And to build, again, sustainable food value systems, decarbonize them, make sure that we create circularity and make them sustainable and, and resilient. Now, that is, of course, a balance, right? We need to balance, as I said, the vision that we have is to make food safe and available everywhere, and at the same time, doing all of what I just mentioned now, decarbonization, circularity, focus on food resilience and food, food loss and food waste. So my conclusion is, therefore, that what we now need is to achieve this transition through a much better integration of all stakeholders, not only business stakeholders through the value chain, but all stakeholders when developing policies. Because we are very much in favor of policies that actually uh, promote 
uh, let's say, in a tangible way, reduction of food waste, reduction of food loss, uh, be it circularity, and so on. So we believe that it's, it's essential to create these platforms for collaboration together with policymakers, civil society, and business in order to make that food system transformation possible. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lex. Um, one thing that crossed my mind when you, when you made your comment is, the, is, of course, the food waste and, and some uh, reasons for food waste. <clears throat> one of it is, especially in Europe, overproduction which also means that uh, we have to talk about reduction in absolute terms and have to dare to speak about it. Um, and this, this question is not coming as a surprise because we, we briefly talked about it. But uh, what, do you see a business model in which you basically will have to do less packaging? Because that's ultimately what may have to happen, at least in the European sphere. Yeah. And, and what could that then look like? Um, because it's ultimately, that's a difficult one. Eh? We, we look at growth, we need to do more, we need to turn volumes. But what would be a business, would that be a possible business model to have less packaging? Uh, well, certainly it can be an outcome of our, let's say, drive to reduce food waste and food loss, right? So if we manage to really reduce waste downstream and loss upstream, certainly, as you said, waste downstream will reduce the amount of packages that are actually produced and sold by Tetra Pak and, and used by our customers and consumers. That is something that is a desirable outcome for us because it will lead to be true to our purpose of actually reducing food waste and you know, protecting food. So yes, that is a uh, expected outcome. And you may then ask, why would a company like ours actually uh, drive for such a, uh, well, first of all, as I said, it is to be true to our purpose, but secondly, we are more than a packaging company. We are a food company. And we believe that this will position us also very competitively to uh, other companies, right? So it's really to make sure that we deliver on our purpose and our vision, but also being uh, central in the food value chain and thereby creating decarbonization, creating food loss and food waste will make us in the future a much more competitive company. Thanks, Lars. I hope you find very, uh, a lot of partners uh, and find a great coalition also in the business community. And I think it's an overall observation that when the business community would come together and to indeed ask for a regulatory framework in which they then have this investment security, that that's a very powerful message and that we, I think we have to hear more of um, in, in many contexts. And uh, it has to do with governance because that's when yeah. governance sometimes also wakes up. So you have to be honest about it. Um, we had two uh, very, um, let's say, rich contributions. And before you get even more rich contributions uh, from Esther and from Joe, you may have already have some punctual questions. And I would like, so you, there's an opportunity now to ask a question. It's not for a statement, sorry. Maybe we can we have some time later. But if you have a question to, um, to Charlotte or to Lars, something that triggered your attention or something that wasn't clear, this is the moment. It's Marco, I believe, eh? Marco from Greenpeace that I heard before. <laughs> yeah. And if no one else, I'll just keep looking at hands and then I can would pass on. No one else? Okay. 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 Yeah. 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 Okay, now yes, it works. Um, I I haven't it's because of your elephant in the room. Um, and what Lars has presented in, in terms of a business case. Um, in which way do you think we could manage to start internalizing external costs? Because your company clearly uh, is a dominant uh, company globally, and you have uh, a very clear view of you know, where some costs are being externalized. Are you looking into that, or do you have as a professional an idea of how in the future, we could focus our attention to okay. solve this issue. So that's one. And then we have a second one here. And you'll have to introduce yourself because I haven't heard you before. Hi. Um, my name is Andrea Ferret. I work with the French Water Partnership. And my question is also on that question of the business model and how, as a private company, you expect uh, to make that work. Um, often when we talk about sustainable food transitions, we talk about descaling and becoming more local. Um, do you see that working in your business model? Do you expect to 
sort of adapt to this, um, this aspect of the transition? And if so, how? Okay, so those are two for Lars. Um, governance seems to be a bit too complex at the moment or too heavy for the afternoon. I have a, still a good question for Charlotte, no worries. Um, well, okay, I take a third one and then we have to move on. And just also please uh, make it short if you can. Just a question and not an elaboration. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Thanks, actually, I, I have a question for Charlotte because all of that begs the question of what is the system that people would vote for? What does it look like in a way for the private sector? You no know, degrowth or doing less doesn't seem very appealing. We talk about purchasing power and all these things. Uh, how do we make that system that works within the pl planetary boundaries something that people and citizens could vote for? Is there a need for a new narrative on this? All right, that's a, the one million or even more million billion dollar question. Um, but I think Charlotte will, have, will do, have a great attempt. So I'll let Charlotte answer this first. And then for the two questions that Lars said, he can think a bit longer. <laughs> Charlotte, go ahead. This is the one million dollar question. Um, there are two answers to this, I think. Um, I'm not sure people are going to vote for it. That's, that's something else. But I think there are two ways. First, we need to make sure that we can actually take into account the planetary boundaries in the way we produce policies, the way we evaluate them, and the way we, we, we implement them. And this, in a sense, means that we need to revise the way we assess uh, the need of a new policy before it comes into play. So coming back to uh, Luke's uh, scheme in the beginning, it's not just about asking about how to shift or how to um, um, uh, support, but it's also about how, how to avoid some policies. And this is a tricky question. We know that there are some 70% of policies that we already have in place, uh, supporting uh, housing, supporting uh, um, uh, transport, supporting agriculture, supporting pensions, supporting uh, some um, uh, aspects of the health uh, system that are not necessarily going towards carbon neutrality. And this is a particularly tricky question, but we so far do not have um, the, uh, the way to assess and to go through each of these policies with something as simple as a cost-benefit analysis, for example, that we've been using for 30 to 40 years in order to assess and to look into each policy. So this is one thing. And then the second aspect is to also build coalitions to engage with a variety of communities um, and to um, uh, think differently and to communicate about those hard choices. I'm not sure many governments have been quite vocal so far about how hard those choices are going to be in the short, in the medium, and in the longer term. Let's hope those choices come to the table, also in 24. <laughs> uh, Lars, over to you on the externalities. Yeah, sure. I, will, I, will, I will start with the, uh, how do we internalize the external costs that we, that we create? And I think it's an excellent question. And I will answer it by saying that in some cases, well, we are, first of all, we are making very heavy investments in general in order to drive this transition that I talked about be it because we really need radical innovation in order to make this change. Whether it is to significantly reduce the uh, food loss that our equipment would generate, right, through processing or packaging. So we are investing, uh, you know, significant amount of money in making that transition possible. That makes good business sense because of course it reduces the operational cost of our customers. So, so there it's really linked to making good business sense. The business model is that. Another example is uh, on uh, collection and recycling, on the circularity of food packaging. There, I can say that we are doing massive investment. We are making actually a uh, investment of about 100 million euro per year to actually move to a fully fiber-based package. Today, a Tetra Pak package is about 70% made of fibers, renewable material, and we're moving, we're actually investing 100 million per year to make that a fiber-based package. Why do we do that? It is to make sure that it is much more attractive for recyclers to recycle, to create you know, a better business models for those recyclers uh, who today you know, may be struggling with the economics. And the last thing is that we are also ourselves investing in the infrastructure for collection schemes, collecting the packages so that consumers know where to go with their packages. 
and we have invested in the last couple of years about 200 million euro directly into collection schemes, into recycling uh, capacities together with partners around the world. So those are just some examples. Yeah. Thanks, Lars. A lot of investments going on. Um, and normally then in a context one would ask, what do your shareholders say about that? But your answer is you don't have any. We don't have any. We are so that's, a and I think that's company. The, the, that's the point I wanted to make before. Uh, it, yeah, there seems to, if there's less pressure from shareholders, there seems to be things that are possible. Um, the externality question, of course, is a bigger one. It is, has to do with natural capital accounting even and, and other parts, and it's, it needs to be regulated, I think. If we would hear business push for that, we would have better chances to get there. Yeah. Um, thanks, Lex. And I think you would kind of in integrated some of the responses for the second question. The localization question is a, yeah, is a far stretch. It has to do with the governance part as well. It has to, to do with the trade part. I mean, it's, it's a huge question. Um, maybe I'll, I'll let you answer it later on if we have a bit more time. Sure. Because I'd, I'd like to come now to, to Esther, um, Esther Asin. Everybody knows her, I think, in this group here. But she is the director <laughs> for the EU policy office of WWF in Brussels. And, and Esther, we had a bit of an analysis this morning already where the Green Deal is, where it stands. It, I would like to hear you, some of your views on this because we haven't heard those or we're not even able to hear them this morning, um, but also what you expect and what you think uh, the priorities will be that for the 24 election. So it's a bit of a double question, looking at the current status and then looking forward, what is civil society expecting? Okay, thanks, Luca, and thanks, IEP, for inviting me to be here today. So I'll start with the first one, and maybe I, you know, Joe can follow as well, and, and I'll take the second. Well, we fear a lot of positives, and that's true. Uh, the European Green Deal, since its beginning, has been in crisis mode, a pandemic, a war on European soil, and still is a priority for the European Commission. That's still quite a hit. And, and, and we've talked a lot about the amount of legislation. I think you've been floated with legislation and policies. And there we need to recognize the work of the Commission as institution and staff being also very constrained. And we need to acknowledge that the Commission over the past year has to step up what we call the infringements as well. So taking member states to court for not implementing EU law. And that's quite a political thing, because are you going to annoy France for not respecting the EU Birds and Habitats Directive? Well, the Commission has done it. The, the, the European Green Deal at the beginning was really a very focused climate agenda. It was the climate neutrality, but it's true that it has also uh, become a much broader agenda, putting, as you said, look, I think that's a sign of hope, nature and environment at the center of the EU political um, uh, decision making. And we've talked about these uh, laws to prevent deforestation products to enter into the EU markets or the nature restoration laws, so showing what could be a nature positive um, legislation as well. But I mean, sorry, I have a lot of concerns. And I think there's been a lot of complacency as well in, in the first round table. I think the first, and Charlotte, you said that, the European Green Deal is basically a Brussels bubble agenda. It's been embraced by the European Commission. Great, is the flagship, and very much supported by the European Parliament. But it doesn't seem to, to be alive amongst the national governments. And the, the results of the Environmental Council yesterday Sorry, I disagree, they're a disaster, and we can talk over that, but it shows that there's no ownership of this political agenda in most of the member, state, in member states. There's also the level of ambition, and we've been talking about science as well, but often the Commission proposals have been not science-based. I mean, proposing to qualify glass and gas and nuclear as sustainable investments, I don't think that the science is telling us that, but also the climate, the climate targets, the 55 that we keep talking, the Commission failed to conduct an impact assessment to, to see whether the 65% scenario, the one that the science telling us, uh, was possible. Um, then, you also mentioned that, Charlotte, there's a lot of mismatch between the stated ambition in all the strategies, great, you know, we are going to restore, I don't know, 30% of European land and sea by 2030, great action plans. When we get into the legislation, this is where you see the mismatch. And this, this is where you see the pushback. And we've talked a lot about food and agriculture, and I will not comment on that. So maybe just to close as well with the biggest concern that the European Green Deal, and it's stated in the first paragraph, is an economic growth strategy. It's not systemic enough and is very Eurocentric. 
So I, I'm sure, Joe, you will comment about that. But the social dimension is critically being overlooked, clearly. And, and here, what I'm, I'm going to quote our colleagues in the European Environmental Bureau, EEB, who are also conducting a bit of an NGO assessment of the European Green Deal. And they said, without using the right compass, the European Green Deal will not reach its declared destination. The compass needs to target a post-fossil fuel system change, a circular economy revolution, a true commitment to zero pollution with our harmful chemicals in our products, and a commitment to a regenerative well-being economy. And this well-being economy is partly the response that we believe our national governments should be embracing as well. How we measure the success in our societies is not by the simply growth, but it's how people feel in their lives and how the policies support this well-being of people and the planet. And definitely, youth voices, um, ethics, and the science can provide this compass. And I'm happy to tell a bit more after, about after 24. <laughs> OK, Esther, thanks. So we take it in, take it in two parts. Um, yeah, we talk about uh, localization, if we come back to that, if it comes to uh, food production and, and, and packaging uh, aligned. Um, and then we look at uh, the Brussels bubble, and then we don't uh, seem to get it all right at the national level yet, let, let alone subnational or, or local. But sometimes, and this is, I speak from experience because I worked a lot with subnational governments and, and local governments before, when they are active and they are um, ambitious, they can push their national levels as well. Eh? So that's an, a bottom up governance uh, that goes even beyond what, uh, what our civil society sometimes can do. And I think that role, as you mentioned before, is also critical. So again, in a way, Esther, you refer to governance but also to the reality check, and I think is, uh, this is this famous uh, saying about uh, what is politically feasible is, is ecologically irrelevant still. Eh? Um, mm. And so how do we get that political feasibility up is actually the main question, I think, for the coming years. And to see that how important it is, it's health related, it's a social context. It's in the end all about redistribution, eh? and it's in redistribution in the current generation, but also to the future generation, and that's my bridge to Joe. Uh, Joe, do you believe that the EU can actually really get such a transition going uh, that is actually to a livable society and a very fair society in the future? And, and what, what are your hopes uh, and potentially also your doubts? So there's a lot of conversation about the technological battle that, that, that has to be won. Um, but the, 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 the most important one for us, certainly, is, is there's another battle, which is the, the mental battle, the, 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 the social battle. Um, and, and I want to do a bit of a sleight of hand and, and when we talk about, you mean, the, 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 the social provisions within the, within the Green Deal or the lack of them. And I want to make it slightly more tangible and concrete, and I want to talk about well-being. And I want to, I want to mean three really specific things about that. First thing is about mental space. So we can't, we can't take action if we don't have the mental space to do it, right? We, we, if we don't hope in the future, we're not going to invest in it. We're going to optimize for the short term. And if I want to get people to cut meat consumption, for example, which is a, a pretty good idea if we want to do some serious stuff in, in, in terms of reduction, um, we're not going to be able to in, inspire action if, if we don't have hope in the future and, and if we don't have um, that, that piece of well-being. I think the second, second piece of well-being is, is about responsibility, right? It's not, it's not the responsibility of the 20-somethings the to, to make these changes. It has to happen now. It has to happen with this leadership. Uh, and Luke stole, stole a bit where I was going, going with that because that requires these systemic changes, right? We can't say, hey, you young consumer, you can make better decisions. Um, you, can, you can choose A rather than B. We actually need the system to, to in some way preface those decisions for us. Uh, and we're talking about materials budgets. We're talking about reduction in the inputs that are going into the system, reduction in choices. And I get that those are really, really politically unpopular, but if we don't talk about them now, if, they, if the current generation of leadership do not take responsibility, I think they're handing a, a well-being disaster into the next generation who are going to be faced with an insurmountable problem. Third and final point is well-being is about the ability to accept change. And again, Luke, again, stole my points. <laughs> um, and, and we've got to face up to a really difficult reality. We are moving into a totally new paradigm. I'm talking about a post-growth economy. I'm talking about a lot of the people and faces in this room are going to probably live in an environment where GDP is very low or nothing. Uh, increase, GDP increase growth. Mm. 
Um, and um, I mean, GDP nothing would be pretty scary. Um, so so how, does a, how does a Green Deal incorporate these concepts? How do we think about those? Um, and, and how can we create something like a generational Green Deal, which allows the mental space to be able to take some of these tough decisions, that the, the responsibility is driven to the right people, the people now, uh, and not passed down the line, and, and how the, we're, we're able to, to really move through a, what is going to be a fundamental change in how our society operates. Um, and I think from the young perspective, those are things we're very clearly hearing. Um, and, and again, that, that, the social provision, um, I, I think we can, we can concretize that by talking about the well-being of the next generation. And there's some damn hard questions there. Thanks, Joe. Um, and of course, we have seen the youth movement moving the agenda. Eh? It's clear. The, uh, and now I'm going to refer to someone who's much younger than you, but uh, Greta, with her intervention in Parliament, has definitely uh, been able to change some of the mindset. But my question to you is, there is an ask to the politicians to live up to the targets. Science-based targets, if you look at them, are extremely uncomfortable. <laughs> They're very uncomfortable. It, needs, it means a redistribution of material wealth to be within the planetary boundaries, which means that in the West, we have to reduce our consumption, not just a bit, but drastically. And that means smaller houses, less, of course, not a car even, um, less uh, traveling on holidays with flights and everything of that. And the current generation, and I try to, well, I'm, I'm, I'm from the current generation, and I would hope to, but we are not there yet. But if the young uh, people would hammer that nail and accept that we would be living in a world that has well-being but not high levels of consumption, that would be a very strong message to decision makers. And then for the young coalition and the, the European Youth Forum to come with also some proposals for what that then would look like, uh, because that's a society that the young generation then would want, and then politicians could take it on board, because in our generation, we don't even dare to have the discussion about drastically reducing consumption, because it's just, it, it, you're politically dead if you do that. Eh? Many politicians say it, I know what is needed, but if I propose really what's needed, what's really evidence-based, I don't get re-elected. As simple as that. But the young generation can make a difference. And coming back to the business community, if the business community is eager to move in that direction and has a strong voice to the decision makers, that is a, a strong coalition. And uniting youth and businesses is, is, would, be, would maybe be the game changer. Who knows? Um, maybe, some, Joe, you want to come back on that? And then I'll pass to Esther for the future. And then to Lars on the localization uh, question. So we have a bit of a flow. And you just take it from one from the other. I'm going to steal your mic now. Does that work? Yeah, that seems good. To work. I can hear you myself. Just have to be very close to it. <laughs> um, so it's the mic. <laughs> but a re but a really 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 quick response to that. Um, you've you've sort of hit the nail on the head, right? The the participation rate of young people in voting is is pretty low, mm. and we've got to change that. Um, we we've got to drive that up radically. Uh, but the second problem is we're assuming that young people will vote progressive. Mm -hmm. If we look at our dear. <laughs> French elections, and we look at the 25 to 35 cohort, they voted Le Pen. And I hope they don't particularly believe in what she stands for, but I think they're shouting, I think they're screaming at the system that it's not doing what they want it to do, and that's a lot to do with this agenda. All right, Esther, you want to look forward in your second intervention? Um, well, we've, we've tried that huh? while well, writing the notes with, with my team, and we said, well, it's, it, we don't have the crystal ball. And the conditions, Charlotte, you, remember, you referred to that, that they were in 2019, are not there now. That's, that's very clear. But a few points for reflection. The first, what I said, is this compass. I think from the very beginning, we need to set clear that this is about a social and an environmental and an economic agenda. You know, that, and we need to get support for this agenda from citizens, from your group, from businesses. What you said about the collaboration, that has to become you know, the way we, we do things uh, very, very clearly as well. But as I said, uh, that we, we try to get this systemic change. We talk about electric cars and electric vehicles, but we don't be able to, all of us, own an electric car. How we are going to charge it if you live in a tiny apartment in the center of Brussels? You might not even able to own a bike. So it's how we then reflect about sustainable mobility for everyone. And this is where all then have a role to play, local, uh, local authorities, regional authorities. So we need to get that. And how we get it as well, I think, is by having these debates at national level. 
It can be just happening in Brussels at the time of European Councils or at the time of the European Parliament elections. We have two years now to start promoting these debates at national level and getting national governments to buy on this agenda. Um, two more points, the financing. The financing is super important because the EU budget is still a significant, it's, it's, it's a small when you compare it to the GDP of the member states, but it's a significant tool. And what we've seen now, for instance, with the national resilience and recovery plans, when there's money, member states get very interested. They all submitted super timely their national plans to the European Commission. Not all. After the elections, there will be also the, the, the renegotiations of the EU budget. And this new budget needs to be a tool to support in this European Green Deal 2.0 or something. Last point, as I said, we still have a couple of years, and there are key pieces of the legislation now entering into the system. We have to make sure that we get them right. Thanks. Thanks, Esther. And just on the multi-annual financial framework for the people that are um, most aware of the context where, where this happens, there are indications that these discussions will happen earlier. So I think, uh, and this is because of, of the, the war in, in, in Ukraine at the moment, that there is going to be an advancement of that, of that discussion. So we have to uh, give the right arguments uh, to the decision makers to make the right choices when they put the money where the mouth is, so to say. Uh, Lars, we, we skipped a bit that question on localization. Yeah. And of course, it's, it's a tricky one because it has, eh, can have trade repercussions or um, consequences, and of course, in a way, some of the instruments that we have seen now may lead to that and may also be a good thing. But what do you think from your part and from your industry and from your point of view, what, what that localization could mean for your uh, approach and your business model? Well, first of all, it's absolutely happening, uh, whether we drive it or not. So localization is the trend of the food industry in every aspect, driven by consumer needs, driven by local players taking more share from global players. So actually the trend is in the direction from global to local in the food system already today. Now we are a company that acts both global, of course, but very much local. We are represented at 190 countries around the world and we regard already before this trend happened, the food and food system as a local Affair. It is, it is actually on the local level that we need to act and we need to invest. Having said that, in order to be true to our purpose and our vision again to make food safe and available, meaning affordable everywhere, we need also to still leverage some scale advantages in order to keep the costs down of our products. But the trend is there and we operate increasingly on a local level, also in terms of food system, food system transformation, and reducing food waste, yeah. Thanks, Lars. So I think now we've had a lot of, nah, food for thought, it's a bad expression, but I, this is the best way to say it. Um, there's a lot of argumentation that I'm sure did not have to convince you, because I think most of the people here are convinced, and if I would ask who is not convinced of what we need to do and what, you, what you've heard, most likely you will not even dare to say. <laughs> but it is, it is indeed a fact that we need to convince those that are not convinced, and we have our conferences a little bit and too often among ourselves. So, so if each and one of you can walk out and take some with you what you heard or extra information you took away, that's helpful. But we're not done yet, because we have a last round of questions, and then we'll have the concluding remarks of our speakers, and then I'll try to wrap up, and then uh, we go to the cocktail. So it's two here, three, and then I take one, four. Those four, that will be it with the time that we have left. And I'll start just from right, and then go to the back. So please, and please introduce yourself again. Thank you, Emily Stewart from Open Society Foundations. And I think your last point, Luke, leads well into my question about talking to other people. So. Esther, you said that the Green Deal is not really alive among the member states. That's not necessarily true, and in a bit of a worrying way. I think when we see the Green Deal manifesting itself in member states, it's been as potentially a new emerging wedge issue amongst populists. And I'm thinking, for example, of the billboard campaigns the Polish government recently financed themselves, which talked about energy price rises being as a direct mm. consequence of the EU Green Deal. So, Looking forward to the next elections, I'm wondering if we have any thoughts on what the European apparatus might need to do in order to spread positive messaging about the green agenda, um, and maybe even 
could we think about something that looks a little bit like the conditionality around rule of law, you know, that, that member states and their governments have to demonstrate some sort of working together with the Green Deal or, you know, talking positively about the benefits in order to be able to access things like resilience funding in the future. Thank okay. You. Thanks for that. I think it's one that can be picked up in the concluding remarks because it's, it's a general one and maybe you can, you can take it into account when you do your final words. Please. Yes, hello. I'm Masha from Eurocities. I work on the localization of the European Green Deal. Uh, my question is somewhat similar to Emily's. Okay, then uh, we go to the next. Sorry. <laughs> um, no, I think what was said is right that uh, uh, subnational governments can inspire higher levels of governments to act, uh, but in some countries they can not, cannot simply do so. We have a lot of cities who revise their climate targets upwards, and those are cities that are in Central Eastern Europe. Uh, it's uh, Zagreb, uh, Prague, Warsaw, all the cities have made enormous leaps forward. Um, but unfortunately, we don't necessarily have the right enabling framework for the cities actually to act or to benefit from recovery facility, facility okay, also coming from EU level with uh, things like direct funding that can actually accelerate the green transition. So, um, so what question, is your question? One question is, what kind of social and political coalitions do we need to, to keep this long-term perspective? Because short-term measures are risking to actually like kill this long-term perspective where we see what is happening with opening up coal power plants where local okay. authorities have nothing to say. So what is your, to join up the question, your, uh, your strategy of joining forces uh, uh, ahead of the elections? Okay, they're not a coalition question, but uh, again, I, if, if someone would like immediately to respond to that one or any of them, but let's take them maybe, um, because it's all part, I think, of a more concluding uh, effort for this panel. And then, lady in the back next to Marco, who I happen to know who he is, <laughs> but I don't know you. I don't have a name. <laughs> so, um, Marilda from BirdLife, I have a question for Charlotte. Um, I, um, I wanted to ask you, how do, uh, how do you see the, um, the implementation of the policies in order to achieve the two, 2030 targets will change, will need changes, and substantial changes, and some of the actors will need to do these changes, and so for some of them, the changes will, will uh, be, will imply to stop their activity. So how do we um, follow, how do we uh, also try to, 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 to take with us these actors that will have a lot to, to lose? It's an important and it's the compensation story. And then the gentleman at the back. Thanks. Uh, uh, my name is Pierre Duplessis. I'm an African biodiversity negotiator. Um, I've been working on sustainable development for 35 years. I mean, I'm here because um, some time ago I made a keynote address at an IDRI conference and I've been on the mailing list ever since. And I thought it would be an excellent opportunity <laughs> Um, to, to hear also what's going on here. But, and, and I live in Berlin, so I have an interest in sustainability in Europe, just to explain, I'm not just here as a spy. <clears throat> um, I, I want to I pick up on something that Joe said and that Esther said, um, and, and then I want to ask a question around that, which is, you know, I have course two children, 24 and 29, and there's nothing that they would like more to do in the world than have an opportunity to live on the land and look after the land and look after biodiversity. But there's actually no realistic opportunity for them to do that. And, and I think if we're serious about the, you know, what's, happening, what's happening with climate change and so on, that people getting out into nature and living low impact nature positive lifestyles and looking after the natural environment is going to be a key part of sustainability. I mean, um, Esther was saying, if you live in a little flat in Brussels, what can you do, right? Joe was saying, how can I invest effort in my future when I don't have a stake in that future? So my, my question really for the whole panel is, what can Europe do to give its young people a stake in investing their lives and their time in a nature-positive future? Right, that's a great question, and I think it's the one that can that links up to what might be the final uh, remarks, because I also am wary of time, and you're thirst, and I've been told there's a great cocktail waiting for us, so that's... Uh, mm -hmm. um, Charlotte, do you want to go first and also take the specific question then, maybe, or in your concluding remarks, and we go down then from, from your side to me, and then I'll wrap it up. 
Sure. So I also want to pick up on localization, so I'll come back to this in a moment. I think just to answer the question very quickly, and it's, it's a bit frustrating to answer it so quickly, but I think the two dimensions to this, there is the whole issue of compensation and mitigation, and there's the issue of training. Um, in a sense, training and making sure that we offer some alternatives in terms of uh, um, uh, livelihoods, in terms of relocalization, in terms of new uh, futures and new ways to think about how uh, these people, these companies, these territories, these um, 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 ecosystems will uh, change and develop and evolve with the changes coming up. So this is one way to answer your question. No, it's a bit uh, schematic, but I just want to come back to cities and subnational governments. I think one of the ways, I mean, this is one of the areas in which I'm, I'm doing research at the moment, and I find it terribly frustrating because I, when I talk to cities, doing some work, not just all the big networks, but also your cities, ICLE, Polis, but also working with the commission on these issues or national actors, you know, there's a tendency to focus on topics, themes. Let's work on agriculture. Let's think about new technologies. Let's think about policy innovations. Let's leave governance aside. This is a tricky one. This is about politics. It gets into institutions. It means that we might tell member states, we might take subnational governments, how they should organize themselves. We might even speak about more decentralization. We might speak about more devolution of power towards the local level. And I think one of the ways to start thinking differently about how to achieve collectively this political challenge that we'll have in 2024, but also in the 10 years to come, is also to start talking about politics again and putting governance back at the center, not just as a barrier, not just as a problem, but as part of a solution and something that we need to work on. We need to make it work in order okay. to achieve this. So this would be, well, and it's my frustration working on public policy that usually we, we tell us, you know, that's politics, that's not, we'll leave it yeah. aside. It's too tricky. I think we need to, to speak about the tricky bits yeah. and, and to think about it. It's them. interesting. I think it's only, uh, or most dominantly in English, that there is politics and policies, but, uh, and that we make a differentiation there. That's maybe the conclusion of your... Yes. On laisse de côté. <laughs> Lars, the best um, words from engineers yeah, yeah. usually. Lars, your, your um, final yeah, Let remark. me just be short because I see we're, we're running a little bit short on time. But what I wanted to finish with is what do we as a business uh, expect from the Green Deal? Why are we so interested that this succeeds? Well, first of all, I don't think we as uh, Europe, we as the world have a choice. All the things that are in the Green Deal have to be delivered in order to meet the planetary crisis that we see and to be, you know, to, to halt the uh, uh, approach that we have to the planetary boundaries. So in our view, the Green Deal specifically should of course continue and it's not a matter of if, but it is how it is implemented. It is really not about if, it is how. That's the way that we see it. And if I can just conclude with three points that I would like to say from, from our point of view, and I think I'm, I'm talking for, at least for the food business. First of all, it needs to be an inclusive process where industry, together with all other stakeholders, can provide input. And I think this platform, as I said, is a good start, but I think we really would ask for a more structured process where all stakeholders are involved in order to accelerate the implementation of the Green Deal. The second is a science-based approach to policies, which really recognizes the links between the EU ambitions on climate, food system, and overall sustainability. And an example of that would be that before setting new policy measures on packaging, the impact on the food system needs to be considered, right? So the packaging and the food system have to be considered jointly. And then my last ask is that a regulatory framework that gives us legal certainty for long-term investments, or at least risk reduction. Because industries, businesses like mine, and those that we work together with in the food value chain are, investi are investing massively. So policies that can actually support that and lower the risk or even guarantee that those are good investments that will be in line with future legislation is really my third ask. So, Thanks, Lars. Thank I hope you find a lot of partners in the business community to let that sound loud and clear and that it's not forgotten in the election debates in two years' time from now. So uh, wishing you good luck with that, uh, with forging that coalition uh, that I think we talked about earlier, but it would be very powerful. Uh, Esther.
Your final remarks, also um, looking forward a bit, and then I'll... To the comments about um, for 2024, uh, what we need is really an honest debate um, about the progress we made over the life of, of the European Green Deal, and I very much agree, Lars, it has to be science-based. Mm. It has to be an objective review. So we have the European Environmental Agency, IEP, NGOs, you know, they can help. To, it's not the number of political deals that we've concluded, it's whether those deals are putting us on a path to reach climate neutrality, to respect nature and, and, and you know, support the well-being of people. And, and that's very clear. About coalitions, I'll, I'll give you an example about the work we've been doing, for instance, on the EU taxonomy. WWF has been really at the forefront. We co-created this taxonomy with the European Commission. But now there's a moment where you also have to let things go. You need to drop your logo. You need to drop your panda and build the ownership of others for this agenda. And it's happening, it's amazing what is happening now with this delegated ad. Mm -hmm. Very obscure, but you see groups everywhere, you know, going directly to lobby the MEPs and it's not us. So I think we need also to acknowledge, we need to empower others to take up on these agendas. And on coalitions, we, we are, it's a bit of a stretch for WWF, but we are doing that. There's a very good example, the European Alliance for Just Transition where we are drawing from the social sector, the development linked to the trade unions, what it means a good just transition for people and the planet. And the last point about nature, um, well, during the pandemic, nature gave us a lot of hope, at least in Belgium, because we were able to be out, you know, we were able to be out, to walk in the forest, to, to work in, in the nature areas. So for instance, WWF Belgium, they learned from that, and they set up now a very grassroots initiative with local communities in Belgium, local, group in Belgium, in local groups, to really look after the nature there, here, you know, our, our nature. So we really support from very small scale initiatives, but for people to start acknowledging the value that nature brings to our lives every day. And it's not the monetary, it's, it's the mental well-being, it's the space that provides, and basically it's the network that is sustaining us. So we also have to tell that story even more. Um, and I know that it's not an easy one. If you need to choose the end of the month and the end of the planet, it's not the one. But I'm pretty sure we can reconcile both. Thanks. Thanks, Esther. Uh, and of course, again, the social dimension. Uh, this Green Deal will not be a deal if it's not social. And it's not just a transition of skills and workers. It's really a redistributional uh, um, challenge and, and a solution that needs to be found. Joe. Over to you. You have the final word. I will just send people off to the cocktail. But that's, you have the final that's, word. That's cool. You stole all my speaking points, so I'm going to steal all yours now. Yeah, please, no. Please steal. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm going to end in a very different place than, 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 than where I thought I'd end. Um, Pierre, I think, was that your name? Um, uh, let's drop it. Universal basic income. Um, where's that debate gone? That's an interesting one. Um, remove the, the need to do lots of things, and your kids can, can, can live on the land. Um, crazy expensive, crazy big idea, but hey, that, that might be interesting. Um, where I'm going to end is um, we need to evolve the Green Deal um, to support well-being, right? Um, and a part of that is also better civic education. And, and I think a lot of what we're talking about is we need to get young people out voting. Um, and, and there's a hell of a lot of things we can do about that. The AFCO committee um, for the, the 2024 elections um, at European level for the first time have allowed voting at 16. Um, and we know that if you vote early, you continue to vote. So it's, and, and this then sort of sums up in terms of how do we get member states more, and more aligned and more involved, right? Um, Belgium's gonna do vote 16 because they do it all the time. But you know what, there's a bunch of people here who are French and the French probably won't do that. So why not go fight for that? And I guarantee you, if you get a load of 16-year-olds going to vote in the European elections, they're probably going to vote in the national elections. They're probably going to be a little bit more progressive. That's at least what the data says. And that might change a ton of the stuff which some of the questions were at. Thanks, Joe. I think that was a, a, a really great conclusion of where we have to be heading at. Um, it's connecting la politique et les politiques, eh? as you said before, or the policies and the politics. And, and, and let's not forget that political feasibility versus ecological relevance. Uh, the business community that uh, uh, is, is upping its game, upping its game, and, and, and hopes, and I think many, when they see businesses uh, perform as Tetra Park uh, is, is, is doing and trying, is giving hope. Civil society that realizes that it is a much broader exercise and a coalition of forging and, and, and finding. Uh, and for that coalition, yeah, there is another two years uh, to go to make it even louder. And then the youth force. We heard loud and clear, and of course, that is a, can be attractive, of course, for politicians. Maybe the short term is a bit of a problem, but the future voters 
or the current young voters uh, having a loud vo voice is, is, is crucial. Um, a lot of good ideas, uh, already a coalition forged here between science, political science, uh, business, uh, part, two parts of civil society, and the, the ones that try to bring the evidence to the table from the institutions, which is the agency. Uh, we don't do politics, definitely. We don't do policy even. We are not supposed to, but we, I think we try to inspire policy, the policy makers, both at the European and at the national level. 